but I'm here to talk about seven straightforward rules for the patient investor, and this is whether you're picking your own stocks, your own bonds, or going down the collective route, passive or active. Hopefully these rules will, will apply to, to all of you, whatever your preferred modus operandi. So those are the magnificent seven rules that we're going to whiz through in the next 20 minutes. But the first one, in fact, I've cheated. I've actually got nine rules. But the, 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 first, the first two aren't mine, and, but they are from somebody who's made a lot more money from investing than I ever will, this gentleman, Mr. Buffett, to whom I will refer a lot, and I apologize for doing so in advance, but again, his record is so good, he really does, you really do have to pay attention. So there we go, rule number one, don't lose money. Rule number two, never forget rule number one. Now, obviously, that's an awful lot easier said than done at any given time, and we're all gonna pick duds, whether we're professionals or whether we're doing it for a little bit of fun or whatever, we are all gonna pick the losers. But what I'm trying to say here is, don't just think about reward, always think about risk at the same time. Lots and lots of retail investors come to me and say, I'm very risk tolerant, and then they'll change their mind potentially quite quickly if they lose money quite quickly, and then their risk tolerance collapses. So that's always one rule to remember. And the second is that just because you're taking a lot of risk doesn't guarantee you a lot of return. If high-risk investments guaranteed you high returns, they wouldn't be high-risk investments in the first place, would they? So yes, when you make a selection, whether it's a fund or a stock or a bond or whatever, make sure that the potential rewards compensate you for the risk that you're taking, but don't assume that because you've picked something that's fizzy-wizzy, it is automatically in a double or treble on you because it might actually go the other way and go to zero. So rule number one, so always think about protecting your downside and building in a margin of safety because losing money isn't much fun, even if money won, money, earn, you know, money won is twice as sweet as money earned. And again, this is what we're trying to avoid. Loss, injury, you know, the possibility of loss or injury, and obviously therefore in portfolio terms, the definition is losing your money on a permanent basis. And obviously you only lock in the loss once you sell. If you're able to tough it out to the side and the thesis pans out, you'll be okay. But obviously, the, it, the one thing that can happen is that you can lose heart, panic, sell at potentially just the wrong time. And let's face it, lots of people were selling very aggressively on you know, March the 7th, 8th, 9th, 2009, right before the market bottomed. So that's what we're trying to help you avoid, selling at just the least opportune time. So the first rule is liquidity. Most people think liquidity just means, well, I can click a button and AJ Bell's magical dealing team will deliver the price I want in the stock or bond or fund I want whenever I want it. And that's the dream world, and believe me, we will always strive to give you best execution. But it's not always as easy as it sounds, and so don't take liquidity for granted, because the definition of liquidity is being able to buy what you want, when you want, in the size you want, at the price, most importantly, at the price you want. You may well be able to find a buyer, but don't necessarily believe that it's going to be at the price you want. If in the end you're being so smart selling it, why on earth are they going to want to buy it? So you've got to think of there's got to be somebody else on the other side of the tray. There isn't just a, you know, a magic little goblin waiting to hoover up the stock or sell it to you. So please bear in mind that it can be, if you need to, it's always certainly better to sell when you can and not when you have to. And again, one of the, since this is an evening that's all about patient investing, I'm sorry, there he is again. But if you aren't thinking of owning a stock for 10 years, don't even think about owning it for 10 minutes because you could end up getting stuck with something that fundamentally you don't necessarily feel entirely comfortable with. So liquidity at the moment market, you know, you'll hear the word liquidity a lot and people often define functioning markets as liquidity, but it's not always theirs. You know, <clears throat> As the American wit and rather poisonous writer Dorothy Parker once said, you know, that love is like mercury in the hand. Watch it and it sits there, clutch it and it darts away, and liquidity can be exactly the same. It will disappear when you most need it. So again, to build in a margin of safety, don't assume you can just do anything you want when you want, because it isn't always the case. And I won't read all of that out, but this is J.K. Galbr Galbraith's book on the 1929 crash. And just look at the bottom bit. Often there were no buyers. And only after some wide vertical declines could anybody be induced to bid. So again, don't assume that because you want to sell when you want to sell, there will be a willing buyer on the other side, particularly when times get tough. That isn't a problem right now, generally speaking, but we've all got to be prepared for the day when one day it just might be. So again, don't assume. And this is certainly going to be one of the biggest tests potentially for exchange-traded funds 
They came through the last down cycle pretty well, touch wood. Thank you very much. I'm not aware of one single exchange-traded fund that actually uh, ceased to function or folded during the, the great financial crisis. But we obviously have seen flash crashes since when ETFs that have whipsawed around. And certainly one of the big questions we've got over bond ETFs is if the underlying asset is illiquid, which on balance it is, and I'm sure Rob will talk, Robert will talk a lot more about that shortly, how can the ETF be liquid if the underlying is not? And we're going to find out, I'd imagine, at some stage. I don't know the answer, by the way, but we will, at some stage, I'm sure, find out. And yeah, the world at the moment is awash with liquidity. This is a different type of liquidity. It's the stuff that central banks are sloshing around the world in their attempt to create a, a wealth effect. And they've done it remarkably successfully. This is the, big, the aggregate big five central bank balance sheets against the FTSE all world. And it's a pretty close fit. So clearly one of the interesting things is going to be the Fed is now moving from quantitative easing to quantitative tightening. The Europeans are just backing off a little bit. The Bank of England has stopped adding. The Japanese are still at it absolutely hell for leather and probably will be for some time to come. But nevertheless, we are getting to an interesting tipping point in that a different type of liquidity, maybe, just maybe, is going to start to dry up a little bit. And there are two things that generally make bull markets. Liquidity is one. Leverage is the other. Now, this is liquidity. The sources of them at the moment, the central banks, the biggest ones, record high dividend payments, share buybacks, lots and lots of sources of cash right now. What you're probably going to need to find out to find out what's going to get this, bear, this bull market to go wrong is where that money's going to go. Where's it going to be wasted? Where's it going to be gassed away? Where's something going to go wrong? Could be bad Chinese loans. It could be European non-performing loans. It could be cryptocurrencies. It could be unicorns. It could be one of a dozen different things I can think of. Right now, the world is awash with liquidity. And until you start seeing some of these things hoovering it up, the bull market will may well continue in lots of different asset classes. Normally, from an equity perspective, I'd expect this to do the job and soak up lots of liquidity, lots of duff IPOs. There haven't been many IPOs this year. In general, they've actually not been too bad. I think the average gain in the UK is around 13%. Uh, and I think if you had to buy on first price trading, which unfortunately most of you people probably did, the average gain is still 5 or 6%. So there's lots of liquidity out there. But again, what you find is that lots of liquidity, people tend to be a lot more fast and loose with their money and put it in places that they wouldn't do normally. Things like that, potentially, for example. So liquidity is one thing that drives bull markets up and then bear markets down and it disappears. The other one is leverage. And just to give you one example, the world is also awash with debt, which is a good thing when there's lots of liquidity to service it. Not such a good thing when it isn't. This is just margin debt on the New York Stock Exchange, retail investors borrowing to trade on margin. And again, which one's the chicken and which one's the egg? I actually will leave entirely up to you. You could argue it either way around. But I would imagine at some stage, if the market does correct, you can get one of those self-fueling situations whereby people are forced to sell margin calls and selling begets selling. Doesn't take a lot of imagination. Thankfully, it doesn't seem to be happening yet. Rule number two, costs. This is when my boss looks absolute daggers at me because I'm going to say to you, please don't overtrade in as many words. They all add up. We'll talk about dividends late and how they compound up. Costs compound up just as quickly. So as we've already mentioned, if you don't want to own a stock or a fund or a bond for 10 years, then you really need to think about why you're owning it in the first place. And again, it's all about patience. You're owning, you're owning a fractional percentage of the company. You're not buying betting slips or bingo tickets or lottery tickets. As a shareholder, that's what you are. You own a fractional percentage of the company. So you need to have a really good idea why you're owning it because you're hoping to accrue the benefits of that in return for the risk that you're taking, which ostensibly is dividends as an equity investor. Okay, Emmett from Lego. Everything is awesome. Incredibly irritating song. But what I want you to think about is the following. Every time you trade, and I'm not going to tell you what to do, but every time you trade, we bank a commission, we all get paid, I get a bonus, and I spend the bonus on Lego for my children. So what I would like, and then of course the stuff goes up the vacuum cleaner. So what I would like you to remember is that whenever you're thinking about trading, just think of how much Lego is already in my house. Because I don't need any more, they don't need any more, and that, those fees should be in your pension and your ISA, not my vacuum cleaner. That's all I'm going to say on the subject of costs, but that's where the costs go, and that money is yours and my kids don't need it. So, third rule, dividends. Again, we've just talked about think like an owner. As a shareholder, an owner of the company, 
Your reward is, in the end, your share of its cash flow when everything else has been settled. And that then comes back to you in dividends. And dividends, and particularly dividend reinvestment, are the secret source of patient investing. I'm a northerner, so it was never going to be the red stuff. But as you can see, this quote here from Mark Cuban, who's a billionaire. He owns the Dallas Mavericks basketball team. I believe non-dividend stocks aren't much more than baseball cards. They're worth what you can convince somebody to pay for them. Have a think about that. Next time you're looking at a speculative oil driller or a hole in the ground that might be something and might not be, that could be a big cash sink, not a big cash generator. It may work well, but just think of the additional risks that you're taking. You don't know in the end where that one's going to go. You've got a pretty fair idea and a pretty easy valuation, at least on a five or ten year view, if you know there's some pretty consistent cash coming out of the end, you've got a dividend yield to work with. It does make life a lot easier, and it does make protecting your downside easier because these things do tot up very quickly. This just mathematically shows it. Compound annual return, cash over these different periods in the UK, 5.2% a year from cash, compound. Lovely idea, isn't it? I think it's going to happen for a while. FTSE 100, capital only. FTSE, FTSE, sorry, FTSE all share, that should say capital only. FTSE all share total returns. And as you can see, the total return with a dividend banked and reinvested beats the capital return hands flat over absolutely every time period that you can think of. And it is often time. Investing patiently is turning time into money through dividends and harvesting your share of the company's cash flow. And this, if you want to take it to its ultimate, is dividend growth. Because in the end, a rising dividend will drag a share price with it. If you think about it, if a company pays a dividend of a penny now and the share price is a pound, and the company increases that dividend by a penny each year, so in 10 years' time it's 10p, I can guarantee you the share price won't be a pound. Because the yield would be 10%. No, people won't leave that lying around. That would be like pining a 10-pound note on the pavement. So dividend growth. There are 25 FTSE 100 companies who have grown their dividend every year for the last decade. It's not easy to do. But as you can see, the average total re compound return from the average return to average total return from them, again, absolutely marmalizes the index. There's only one, in fact, that's underperformed under that over that time period, which is SSE. Now, I'm not saying these are easy to find. Quite a few of them weren't, weren't in the FTSE 100 10 years ago. So I'm not pretending it's easy. But nevertheless, if you pick the right companies, you can, frankly, just by banking the dividends and reinvesting them, do yourself an awful lot of good. Think like an owner. Have a 3D perspective. Now, cash flow is what drives dividends. That, in turn, reflects operating margin, and operating margin reflects competitive position. If you've got a business that can charge what it wants to charge, you've potentially got a great business. Because they can't go anywhere else, because people feel loyal, and they feel loyal because they like the brand, they like the service, like the quality of the offering. There are lots of, or you've got them captured. You know, there's a, one of my company I often use in this example is Halma, FTSE 250 company. It does lots of things, but one of them are the switches that stop lifts going from the top floor straight down to the basement, which, let's face it, from the department store's perspective is bad because it's unhappy squashed customers, and from the department store's perspective, it's lawsuits and everything else. So paying, playing for the little switch and the guy with the bag is good business, and Halma does that every single year. Thank you very much. So there are lots of ways in which you can have a strong competitive position, but without a competitive position, without pricing power, you're looking at stocks to rent rather than stocks to own. Steel, paper, pulp, airlines, areas where the, a small change in pricing can also make a very big difference in profits. You know, for whatever reason, Burberry can charge 1,500 quid for a trench coat, and if Mr. Gobetti gets his way, it's going to be more. And Burberry makes operating margins of nearly 20%. There is a link between the two. So if you can charge what you want to charge, you've potentially got a very, very good business. If you don't have that pricing power, you've got a very, potentially very weak business. And to go back to Mr. Buffett, why is his business called Berkshire Hathaway? Because it was the worst investment he says he ever made. It made linings for suits. Who goes into a shop and says, I want a particular type of a Berkshire Hathaway lining for a suit? You might go into a shop and say, I want a Paul Smith suit. But you certainly won't go into a shop and say, I want a back to Hathaway line. You don't care. You don't care where the steel comes from for your car. Andrew might drive a Porsche here, but he wouldn't ask for it to be made from Bethlehem steel or Tusson Krupp steel. He just wouldn't care. But he wants to know what the car is. So it's all about competitive positioning. 
And then you need to think about these three things when you're assessing the valuation of a company. Growth, risk, and quality. I'm grateful to my former UBS colleague, Mike Carhill, for, for talking me through this. I've learned more from him than how we work for different companies, funny enough, than when we work together. Growth of what? Is it cyclical or structural? Is it organic or acquisitive? Clearly, organic growth is not easy to do, but it's much higher quality, and it should ideally be growth of cash flow. I, think, I can think of lots of companies who've grown their earnings per share, but destroyed shareholder value, or grown themselves, but destroyed shareholder value. RBS is the most egregious example, but I can think of lots of others. Risk. How are they achieving the growth? Operational risk, lack of pricing power. Financial risk, too much debt. Market industry risk, is it dying, is it growing? Quality. Predictability, strong cash flow, transparency. Organic growth premium, acquisitive growth discount, lots of debt discount, no debt premium, predictability, strong cash flow premium, valuation, lack of discount. It'll very quickly give you a feel. So if the FTSE is on 15 times earnings, you will be able to use these three as a premium, premium, premium. I'll pay 20 times for it because it ticks all those boxes. Or discount, 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 I'm only going to pay 10 times for it. And it'll give you a very good feel for then on a long-term basis which risks you need to factor in and how you factor that into your valuation and the price you pay premium or not. And this, Galbraith again, it's very long, talks about the bezel. This is just a point I've noticed. Very boringly, I went through uh, the report and accounts for all FTSE 100 companies for the last 10 years. It took me about three months on and off doing other things. And the gap between stated earnings and companies' preferred presentation of adjusted earnings is now at a 10-year high. So even today, Vodafone, we're talking about adjusted EBITDA, excluding India, excluding spec. They're making it up. I'm really sorry. I know it's a management tool, and it probably helps you spot cash flow a little bit better. When you've got companies like Smith Nephew presenting, uh, what is it, adjusted sales, uh, what is it, organic sales, adjusted sales, currency adjusted organic sales, the quality of financial reporting is as bad as it has ever been in my 25 years of looking at accounts. And this is something that we need to keep an eye on because at some stage, the tide will go out and companies will get found out. I'm not saying Vodafone and Smith and Nephew are doing anything wrong or illegal, but I'm saying the quality of financial reporting right now is poor. And you've got to be very diligent when you do your work or find a fund manager who can do the diligence for you. Price and value, we've talked about this uh, a little bit already with the growth, risk, and quality. Set a framework in your own mind. Am I going to pay up? Do I think I should deserve to pay up? Or does this company deserve a discount because it's got some challenges ahead of it? You can have cheap stocks or good news, just not both at the same time. And often you will pick up bargains when things are on the floor. That's not necessarily because anything's gone wrong at the company, just because the market's had a bit of a turn. In the end, does it really matter if politician A or politician B has been or gone? Not always. Sometimes it might, but not necessarily. But it can still nevertheless make a very big difference to a share price in the short term. In the long run, it makes no difference whatsoever. So again, always think in terms of numbers. You pay a, a low valuation, you are protecting your downside. You pay a high valuation, you're obviously exposing yourself to risk. You know, it's interesting. I, I don't know whether Marks and Spencers is a buy or not but it's got a market cap of five and a half billion quid, got debt of two, and it's still making 500 odd million pounds a year, even when things are going pretty badly wrong. Snapchat can't even get its customers to pay for its service. It's got a valuation of $18 billion, and it's never going to make a dime. If I was forced to choose between the two, I know which one I'd rather go for, particularly when M&S is offering me a five and a half percent yield to at least try and dig myself out of trouble. Now, I don't know. I mean, Snapchat may become a great investment. M&S may become a dreadful one, but I know what's already currently roughly priced in. This is my favorite example, ARM. Again, just to show price and value, you could have bought ARM for 10 quid there, and it would have taken you 13 years to get your money back. You could have bought it for 35p three years later after a market panic, and lo and behold, the Japanese took it out for up 17 quid. So, you know, you pay your money, you take your choice, but if, I'm not talking about timing the market. I'm just saying be careful about the valuations that you pay. There, the valuations were very high. There, the valuations were very low. So even if things continue to go wrong, there was a chance that something was going to happen and go right in the end. Rule six, four most expensive words in English language at this time, it's different. Please don't fall for that one. It's very tempting. We're hearing it already. Cryptocurrencies, you don't understand. Good. I'll be prepared not to. Bull markets are born on pessimism, grown on skepticism, mature on optimism, die on euphoria. This is my favorite. 
The fundamental business of the country is on a sound and prosperous basis four days before the 1929 stock market crash. Now, that's not to pick on Hoover. We've all been there. We've all done it. We've all got things wrong. But <laughs> just be careful, Janet Yellen. There will never be another crisis. I hope it will not be in our lifetime. I don't think it will be. I hope she's right. So the cycle, we can talk about this. I don't want to tread on Ben's toes or Robert's toes by putting any of their things in here. But that's where I think there's pessimism, skepticism, optimism, and euphoria right now. Look at that later. Bang stocks, cryptocurrencies, index proliferation. This is the cycle. You just be careful here. US GDP rebased to 100. US household net worth rebased to 100. Tech bubble, property and stock market bubble, everything going up at the same time. Unless you know something different, the good Lord doesn't deliver a sack of cash every Friday afternoon. Household net worth cannot sustainably outperform GDP growth over the long run. So either that goes up, that goes down, or they meet somewhere in the middle. It is a little bit exposed, but I don't know when it could go on for a long time if liquidity stays very good. So, lots of different things to think about. The simple way of keeping it very simple is have a checklist. Why did I buy this stock? Why did I buy this fund? Is it working or not? Simplest checklist of all, Charlie Mungers. Do I understand the business? Does it have intrinsic value? Does it have a competitive advantage? Why would I pay for its services? Why would I not? The management have integrity? Does it come at a reasonable valuation? And that will set you in good stead for anything that you look at. So... Manage risk, don't just seek reward. Think about protecting your downside. Don't forget, markets have gone up hugely. Would you walk into a shirt shop now and say, oh, goody, the shirt's 80% more expensive than they were yesterday. I better have 10. Think, because that's effectively what you're doing now with certain stocks. So prepare for the worst when it comes to liquidity. Keep costs down. Think of that Lego. Keep reinvesting your dividends. Take a 3D perspective. Build in a margin of safety or find somebody who can do it for you. Watch the pendulum swing between greed and fear and keep a checklist, whether it's a fund or a stock or a bond or whatever it is that you're buying, and just keep your marbles. Rising prices are a narcotic that affects the reasoning power up and down the line. Thank you, everybody. Two minutes over, not too bad. Thank you very much.